The asset you are selected to take care of begins to show. If you have been a part of this channel for a bit now, I wouldn't be surprised if the video that brought you here was the Jurassic Park Analog Horror video I did last September. That video did extraordinarily well, and I have seen a lot of comments floating about asking for a return to Analog Horror Dinosaurs. Why you guys wish to make me return to one of my worst fears is beyond me, but I am your vessel to take all the scares. One of the best Analog Dinosaur videos I ever saw was the San Diego Incident because that was just a straight up dream I've had before. For those of you who did not come from the dinosaur analog video and have no idea why I would have such an almost exaggerated fear of dinosaurs, to clear things up, it's not necessarily dinosaurs as a whole that cause immense amounts of fear, it's this specific bastard. The T-Rex has been a reoccurring antagonist in my nightmares. I've had a plethora of interactions with these guys either chasing me, trying to find me, just straight up eating me, you name it. And there is a clear difference between watching Jurassic Park or reading about T-Rexes and being face to face with one towering over you, ready to strike. After the first encounter, I was never the same. Actually waking up hyperventilating and not wanting to return to bed. Needless to say, I am afraid of the T-Rex and Jurassic Park has already done a good enough job being scary and these analog horror renditions are no joke. However, coming right up, I have compiled more analog dinosaur tapes that excel at presenting this world in the exact horror light it needs to be in. Pure primal fear. I will have all the entries linked below, so be sure to show lots of love and support to these creators before checking this out. But before I let you get too far, just wanted to say if you're new here and enjoy what you're watching, be sure to hit all those neat buttons down below, including the subscribe and bell notification so you can be a part of every new upload. Also, real quick, just wanted to mention that as of this moment, me and some others are going to be at Phoenix Fan Fusion all three days, May 24th through the 26th. Not affiliated with the event in any ways, just going to have a fun time, so if any of you already have tickets or are planning on it, you might see some familiar faces. There will more than likely be more info and details as the convention gets closer, but anyways, now you can pass through. Our first bit I'd like to cover is the two updated entries in the engine tapes. Now I will do a quick recap to catch everyone up to speed, but I recommend either checking out the series or checking out my last Jurassic Park video where I go over all the previous tapes. The engine tapes obviously take place in the world of Jurassic Park, except the plot hidden in the background involving someone whose dad worked at the park and ended up losing his life. Our main character begins receiving tapes from a mysterious source that instructs him to release them and what's on the tape reveals a larger conspiracy potentially at play. With reports of a plethora of missing people, the occasional casualties, and the eventual relocation project the series left us off on. In the last entry, we learned of the relocation project being introduced in the park. This involved taking all the high-risk assets, aka dinosaurs, and moving them to the secret Site B island. This seems to be an attempt at keeping the public safer in the open park, but the message we end on doesn't seem as such. They lie and lie, a kingdom of lies. They brought back the dead and something else. And with that, we are at our next tape. Advised, 1994, tape four. This entry begins and we immediately learn that some of the assets are starting to show symptoms of some unknown disease. Oh Christ, I can already guess that these park lab geniuses not only brought back extinct animals, but also extinct diseases as well. It is said that Asset 87 was the first to start showing some signs. Some blink and you'll miss it text at the bottom informs us that Asset 87 is a male Spinosaurus. The first and so far only confirmed specimen of his kind bred through de-extinction. Once again, this asset is met with no photo. If I remember correctly, this asset was among the few being moved over to Site B. Perhaps this entry has us at Site B and may mean this disease has a chance to stay contained. This entry immediately proves that hypothesis incorrect, as it said 56 assets have already died due to this disease outbreak. This disease doesn't sound like your typical dinosaur cold, however. These symptoms sound more like possession, if you ask me. We are warned that if any dinosaur we are assigned to watch starts to show any of these signs, then to immediately report it. As if we were questioning why such drastic measures are taking place, they give us a nice calming answer as to why. You may be asking why these measures are being taken into effect, it is because this new virus is very prone to mutation, and we fear that this virus can start infecting humans. So this doesn't seem to be a dinosaur-exclusive disease after all. 
Well, it is as of this moment, but it has the chance to mutate and infect humans. The disease is given the name DX virus, and we very quickly start to glitch out into some interesting discoveries. A voice in the back repeats, he was the first, as we flash on this image of Dennis Todd, the dad of our character investigating these tapes. When we move over to Ashley Chambers, the voice switches and begins to say she couldn't bear the pain. According to the voice, our next victim, Janet Smith, tried to run. We then get text that takes over the screen to give us a pretty haunting revelation. Dennis didn't die due to an asset. I wish I could have seen the sign sooner. Now he's gone. After that, we hear the tape get ejected out of the player, and our entry ends. Our description at the bottom gives us a clue at how our character is handling the news of this discovery. It certainly sounds like Dennis either learned something he wasn't supposed to and was suspiciously taken care of on company orders, and it was covered up to look like a dinosaur attack. I mean, how easy could it get when you have access to giant killer animals? If I had to guess, it's likely the three people we saw at the end of this entry all found out early on about this disease that got woken up, and since I would hope they at least care for the life of animals, they weren't willing to stand by and let them allow a bunch of dinos to drop dead. That's my current theory, but it's possible what they learned was far, far worse. Shipment, 1994. Tape 5. The start of this entry has us watching a seemingly prehistoric commercial for one of the Jurassic Parks, specifically a yogurt commercial where you can win $50,000, and this lady won. However, we quickly get into what we came here for. We cut to an engine security report that talks about the ship, or just one of the ships, that was delivering a shipment of high-risk assets to Site B. An hour into the trip, it said that the ship had lost all communication with the park, and that six hours in, a distress signal got sent out. Luckily, I didn't go through the hassle to decode the Morse code we heard because the next frame translated it for us. Help. They are killing us. Send help. Urgent. Looks like the ship isn't having a very fun time. Following the signal, the island sent out a rescue team that was heavily armed and ordered to kill any asset they saw. We are introduced to Joseph Emerson, who is there to take photos of the scene. Seems like an easier job than the soldiers, except he wasn't equipped with any armor, just a handgun with one round. Hey buddy, that's more than I ever got in any of my encounters with the T-Rex. The first photo Joseph recovers is quite the gnarly sight. It's said that they found the lower part of a man with teeth marks engraved in his skin. The second picture is the vice captain who apparently got thrown up to the ceiling. The third photo is of the sinister looking hallway that caught Joseph's attention. We see in the fourth photo that he saw a dead Dilophosaurus with its skin covered in black veins, which let everybody know that this one had the DX virus. Did this one infect all the others, or did this one go on a solo killing spree? If this didn't seem bad enough, the next photo gets much worse. The captain was said to be found with bloodshot eyes and a twisted grin, and a bullet through the head. Looks like our captain got the new and improved DX virus that infects humans. And it doesn't sound like it has very appealing side effects. It's said that at the end of the day, the rescue crew did not encounter any signs of life. The only thing to report on was the foul odor, which made a member sick and lightheaded. The ship was finally brought to Site B, where a sole survivor was found in the engine room. Miss Ashley Chambers was found hiding, sealed off, barely alive. She was the sole survivor out of the 45 people on board. As for all the dead hostile dinosaurs on the ship, it said it's possible the captain caused a gas leak, which would have gotten the job done. However, that's the end of this entry, and according to our description, our lead character recognizes the name Joseph Emerson, but isn't able to fully connect any dots just yet. I imagine it's possible Ashley Chambers ended up finding out the virus can now infect humans, and that's why she was inevitably offed, even though this report makes it seem like she was found alive. However, I think it's safe to say that the security report didn't seem to make too much mention of the fact that the captain clearly got infected. Sounds like Engine plans on keeping this whole thing as tight-lipped as they can. These next tapes are a part of a different channel, but if you are a fan of the San Diego Incident animated videos, you are really going to enjoy these. And by enjoy, I mean shit your pants. Anyways. Found footage. Outpost B. The tape begins with our familiar engine logo, and in classic analog fashion, we probably aren't allowed to be viewing this footage. It's said that the clips we are about to see were recorded by two security employees during the hurricane of August 1992, a year before the events of our first film. We begin by flipping through the different security cameras around the island. Everything seems to be operating as per usual until we get to the T-Rex area. Once we are on that camera, the footage starts to glitch out, and once we are to our next camera, we see that the whole sector has just experienced an outage. The camera shut down and we are shown the computer screen where we can see a map of the whole island. 
What's the most nerve-wracking is the fact that the electric fences are also not working properly due to this. The two employees working security that night discuss amongst themselves who will be the one to go check things out. I've been last time. Now it's your turn. Yeah, sure. Get going if you don't want to be eaten. Oh, and don't forget to take the camera with you. Our poor soul, who gets chosen, heads on out and is now out in the wild. He exits the jeep and begins to head up the stairs of this facility. He reaches what appears to be a breaker and flips the power back on. Mission success, until he walks out. Shit. Yep, that fence has been completely torn through, and I can only guess who our visitor is. Our unfortunate soul comes face to face with a T-Rex right by his car, and rightfully begins to sprint in the other direction. I don't think this little crate will keep you safe for too long. After a bit, our security worker believes it to be safe as it sounds like the T-Rex has lost interest. He peeked around, and everything looks clear. At first, that is. Thankfully, the end of this entry tries to give us some tips in case this happens to us. I gotta say once again that this is the direction the future Jurassic Park installments need to take. This pure primal horror of being hunted by a creature that you stand no chance against. Found footage. Containment operation. Our entry starts out as usual, but right off the bat, it looks like the tape takes place right after our last one, where it appears someone picks up the camera our unfortunate soul had with him before the T-Rex had him for lunch. We quickly cut to dashcam footage where we hear two employees discussing the incident. It sounds like they aren't aware yet of the status of the security worker, now known as Frank, unsure if he had been eaten or not. We know the answer to this already. Our driver talks about how in the case that Frank is alive, he could be in trouble and in need of assistance, to which our hero driver is on his way to help before... What if the T-Rex escaped its paddock? I hope you're wrong, but if you ever cross its path, don't forget its vision, its vision. Holy shit! <laughs> our driver is able to shake off the crash, but now he is in a very similar situation to Frank, stuck out by himself. Well, I guess not necessarily by himself. Luckily for our character, he isn't noticed by the T-Rex, and the dinosaur fucks off. We find a flare gun on the ground and begin to try and get a hold of the containment team. Once a radio is found, we radio back to the containment team to let them know the T-Rex is in fact on the loose. The containment worker still tries to persuade us to not go find Frank, but all efforts fail as we can't just abandon a friend in need. The plan devised is to go find Frank, shoot the flare, then have the containment team pick them up in a helicopter. Once all that is settled, it's time to head out. Except it looks like we have another surprise visit. Oh. Oh. Oh, thank God. You scared me. I thought you were... Never mind. Even though I know this dinosaur is more than likely zero threat to people, I would still be keeping a safe distance. However, it's back to the race. We find ourselves at Frank's last location in the prior tape, to be met with the unfortunate realization. A flare gets popped to signal the helicopter, except the helicopter is not the only one to notice the bright light in the sky. Funny enough, the flare found a very humorous spot to land. Oh fuck! Oh fuck! Oh no! No, 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 no! It appears that our character gets picked up by the T-Rex and dropped to the ground. However, right before he turns into Dino Dinner, the helicopter swoops in and uses the light to lure the T-Rex away, appearing like it got tranked of some sort. The tape ends with our main character shockingly surviving the encounter. That's a true first, you don't normally see people making it out of these situations, especially considering that he was just that close to being done for. Truly, fate was on his side. I pray, pray, pray that this is a continuing season, because this little two-part segment was great enough, and I was shocked to even see that the second tape carried the story forward from the first. At first impression, I would have guessed these to be more like an anthology, but the continuation was a pleasant surprise. Throughout this whole video, we have seen tape after tape showcasing the true terror of the T-Rex. But this next Jurassic Park analog video I found shows some love to our Velociraptor friends. Quarantine Pen Escape
When this video starts, we are immediately shown an old tape that looks to be a fun promo video for people visiting the park. I can't remember if this is in the movies or if this is footage from one of the Universal rides. Either way, it's cool. After we go through some more footage, we cut to Hammond speaking specifically about the carnivores, and our footage decides it wants to glitch out right when he talks about the man-eating raptors. Once that footage is over, we cut to another tape where we are introduced to Edward Regis, the public relations manager of InGen. According to him, he had been assigned to look after Dr. Harding's daughter for a couple days, and now Hammond has asked him to babysit his grandchildren. Looks like we have some movie characters getting some mentions. Obviously, Edward is not very happy about the task, however, he and his buddy Marco are assigned to go pick the kids up from the East Dock. Once dropped off at the visitor center, we watch as they head to the safari lodge to drop off the bags. It's clear that this is some game engine, but it still looks really neat to be able to see so much of this location. Everything seems to be running as normal. Even when we cut to the computer screen, we see that the tours are even running. At some point later, however, it's said that Sam Jackson's character called for a general evacuation of the island. It isn't too clear when this is all taking place, so is this the incident that occurred in the first film, or is this a separate incident? Either way, it's not too clear what happened to cause this evacuation. Yet before Ed and Marco were able to get to the ship, Marco got orders to hang back so that he could do a final patrol of the quarantine pens. Edward, being such a nice partner, decides to go with. I gotta say, these car storm scenes look really top tier, and I imagine the storm is why the evacuation happened. We periodically cut between the dashcam footage and the radio conversation between Ed and Marco. The basic chit chat back and forth until Ed asks Marco what it is they hold in the pens. The raptors at these pens are said to be brand new, from Site B. I have a feeling that anything that goes down at this Site B leads to nothing good. However, it appears our two leads find their way through the gate and head on towards the quarantine area. However, before we see them get anywhere, it looks as if the storm had killed all the power including the electric fences. Ed goes to check the storehouse, while Marco goes to check the fence, unaware of the power outage that just occurred. Everything seems A-OK -okay on Edward's end, nothing out of the ordinary on cameras. However, Marco reports back that everything seems clear, yet the fence lights aren't on. We very quickly hear the turn of events through Marco's radio, as raptors begin to appear. Luckily for them, Ed and Marco had found an area to keep hidden, yet it wouldn't be too long before a special someone comes looking. While it seems the coast may be clear, our poor soul Ed doesn't appear to be safe for too much longer. The footage cuts out, and we are brought to the conclusion of that Hammond Jurassic Park tape we saw at the beginning, thanking us for our visit and hoping we'd be back. The T-Rex and the Velociraptor are the two standout dinosaurs that nobody ever in their life wants to have a real encounter with. However, the fears they give are so unique in their own right. The T-Rex is very frightening for me due to its size and just the horrifying look it has when coming after you. While the Velociraptor has probably already seen you, and you might as well accept defeat. You have a better chance of hiding in an unreachable area with a giant T-Rex, whereas anywhere you try to hide, the raptor will be able to get you. Things may change, however, if the Jurassic Park IP starts utilizing the supposed real T-Rex roar. Then all bets are off. However, this just goes to show once more that horror and Jurassic Park are just a match made in heaven. I actually stumbled upon the book that has both Jurassic Park and The Lost World together, and I am so unbelievably close to buying it, but I just know that my dreams are going to get extra assaulted if I fill my head with that book but I just know that it'd be worth it. By all means, I urge you to check out these analog horror Jurassic Park pieces because I think they truly stand outside the norm when it comes to this genre. There isn't anything supernatural going on here, whatsoever. It's just the way of nature and the consequences of man thinking they can manipulate it. However, that will probably be about it for this video. I really hope to see more Jurassic Park content out there like the ones I showed off here. Especially the 3D animated ones that just sent me right back to that state of fear some of the movies were able to bring out. Luckily, however, dinosaurs have remained in their extinct time period and only really like to attack in my dreams, and I refuse to imagine a future where people are crazy enough to revive the T-Rex.